Hello, and welcome back to another installment of Grasping Scripture. I'm glad you could join us today as we continue our study through Paul's letter to the church at Rome. Today, we're in the seventh chapter of Romans, and I will confess this is one of my favored chapters. Now, I know if you've been listening to the podcast for a while, you've heard me say that about several books or chapters. And, well, frankly, there are several that are my favorites, but chapter 7 is just one of those chapters where uh, Paul just kind of puts it all out there. He shares his struggle and his humanity with us as he seeks to follow Christ. He gives us an example of what it is to struggle in our obedience to Christ and still follow Christ. And so I just think there is a, a wealth of, of relatability if you will, in chapter seven and things we can latch on to. And again, this is part of that larger discussion. So if you haven't been with us for the rest of our study of the book of Romans, then I encourage you to go back to the earlier episodes of this pod- podcast and join us in the first chapter and work your way up to this. Don't just dive in at chapter seven because you're going to lack some of the background that'll give you context and help you understand. Because our goal with this whole study, with this podcast is to help all of us understand the context, the background, the message of Scripture, so that we can truly grasp Scripture. So I thank you for joining us today as we continue to turn our hearts and our minds towards God's Word. Now please join with me as I begin us in prayer. Heavenly Father, We do thank you for the many blessings that you've given. Father, we thank you for Christ, you coming in the flesh, living among us, dying as a perfect sacrifice for our sin and raising again, that we may have the promise of eternal life in you. Lord, we thank you for the forgiveness of the sin in our lives that we struggle with daily. Father, we thank you that we don't live under the condemnation of that sin any longer, that we are not slaves to it, that it is our master, but that we can turn to you and you become our master. Help us to live as if we are yours, following you and your commands. Now, Lord, as we turn our heart and our attention towards your word today, Lord, I ask that you would give us eyes to see and ears to hear and a heart sensitive to the promptings of your spirit as we study your word today. Help us apply it to our lives as we seek to live lives that bring glory to you and your name. It is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Okay, now as we dive into this seventh chapter of the book of Romans, again, a reminder, go back and cover the first six if you haven't at this point. Uh, You need the background, you need the context of what's going on in Rome. This is all part of that larger discussion about the law versus grace and about what the purpose of the law was, but uh, what the purpose of grace is as well, that it's not something to be presumed upon. It's not, oh, we should sin more so that there's more grace. But Paul is trying to help understand that relationship between the law, which shows us God's character and nature, that law which shows us that that standard of holiness and perfection that we would have to achieve to be right with God based on our actions, and then shows us God's grace, because we will never measure up to the law. We need the grace. But the fact that the law is there. Well, it has an effect on our lives before the grace of Christ. It also has an effect on our lives after the grace of Christ in showing us a standard for which we should strive, giving us an image of what it is to live for God. What's that look like? What does the the godly life that we're called to look like? Well, if we're going to reflect the nature and character, the presence of God in our lives, it's going to match up with the description of his nature and character found in his word. And we, we find that in his law. So let's dig into this seventh chapter of Romans 
It says, now, dear brothers and sisters, you who are familiar with the law, don't you know that the law applies only while a person is living? Now that's verse one. And, and he's addressing all of them in the church at Rome. When he says, you who are familiar with the law, he's not just talking to the Jewish converts to Christianity who would have known the law since they were children, but also to the Gentiles, because many of the Gentiles in the church were God-fearers, but not Jewish. They were going to synagogues and they were hearing the law taught before they ever came to faith in Christ. So this applies kind of to both groups in a certain sense. So he's addressing all of them and he's saying, don't you know that the law applies only while a person is living? What's he mean by that? Well, scholars tell us that they think that's a reference to kind of a rabbinic saying of the day that you're you're obligated to the law until you're dead. And when you're dead, you're set free from the law. Um, and he's applying it a little bit different than that, but he's making his point. Look, the law only applies while a person is living. And then he gives an example, and I want to give caution. The next two verses are not allegory. There's not some vast, deeper meaning. I mean, I meet people that want the scriptures to say more than they say. The scriptures say everything they need to say, okay? God gave us everything we need, not everything we want. Don't start reading chapter 7, verses 2 and 3, and try to draw all sorts of symbolism and allegory out of it. Read it for what it says. Paul's pretty straightforward here, and this New Living Translation renders it really well, really plainly for us, so we can grasp it. He says, for example, an example of what? Well, that the law only applies while you're alive. So now he's going to give examples. For example, when a woman marries, the law binds her to her husband as long as he is alive. But if he dies, the laws of marriage no longer apply to her. That's pretty straightforward, right? If you marry somebody, you are married. You are bound by that legal union of marriage until, or, you know, in the case of one of you dying, then the other one is set free from being married to that individual because they're dead. Okay. Um, it's just a very practical real world example that Paul is throwing out there to make the point that the law only applies for a period of time and it has a definite end. It is a, a finite period that it applies. And he goes on to explain a little more. He says, so while her husband is alive, she would be committing adultery if she married another man. But if her husband dies, she is free from that law and does not commit adultery when she remarries. So the law applies. It's adultery until he dies. Then it's not. See, there's a, a real world application there. And Paul is using all that to make the point that the law applies only while a person is living. It has a, a, a terminal point to it. So, Use that as a framework. That is where Paul is, is beginning to say that, look, there's a period where the law applies, but there's something more, there's something else. We're going to unpack what that something else is and that struggle between the law and, well, grace, the law and Christ. Now, as we pick up in verse four, Paul goes on to say, so my dear brothers and sisters, this is the point. Don't you love it when you're reading scripture and the author of scripture inspired by God just flat out says, this is the point. Well, this verse is for you. So my dear brothers and sisters, this is the point. You died to the power of the law when you died with Christ. Law only applies when you're alive and you died with Christ. Buried with him, raised to walk in a newness of life. We talked about that previously. Now, or and now, you are united with the one who was raised from the dead. As a result, we can produce a harvest of good deeds for God. See, we were bound by the law. But now we've been set free from the law, so we can do good deeds for God. We can produce this harvest for God. <laughs> 
going on in verse five, when we were controlled by our old nature, Sinful desires were at work within us, and the law aroused these evil desires that produced a harvest of sinful deeds, resulting in death. But now we have been released from the law, for we died to it and are no longer captive to its power. Now we can serve God, not in the old way of obeying the letter of the law, but in the new way of living in the spirit. Now that's spirit as in the Holy Spirit of God, but it also kind of is a word play on living in the spirit of the law, the the meaning behind the law, not so much as the letter of the law. Uh, If you want an example of that or an explanation for how that plays out, think great commandment. Uh, Do you remember the great commandment? It's found in multiple places. I believe Mark, uh, what, Mark chapter 12, Uh, is a good place to find it. It's when Jesus was asked, what's the greatest commandment? And he answers these teachers of the law that pose this question, that it is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, and all your strength. That's uh, the Septuagint version of the Shema, Deuteronomy 6. It is that declaration of faith in God and that we are to love him, honor him, worship him with everything we are, everything we have. He said, this is the law. It's the most important command in the law. But he goes immediately into it and says, and the second is like unto it. In other words, there's a second one that's kind of tied to it. You can't separate them. They go together. And what was that second one? Love your neighbor as yourself. What does that mean? It means that we have a relationship with God, that vertical relationship, but that vertical relationship plays itself out in our horizontal relationships, our relationships with other people. If we are going to love God with all we are and all we have, then we have no choice but to love the people around us as well. We, we can't escape that. It changes well everything. And he says that the whole law and the prophets are contained in these commands. Well, what's he mean by that? He means that if you get that right, if you get your relationship with God right, and you live out that relationship with God in the relationship with the people around you, with others, you don't have to worry about the letter of the law. Because it's going to fall into place. Because you were living with a heart obedient to God, seeking to follow him and live out your relationship with him through every aspect of your life, you don't have to worry about how does this fit with the letter of the law, because you're not going to be doing anything that runs afoul of the letter of the law. Remember, I've already said the Old Testament law gave us an expression, a a, a glimpse into the nature and character of God. It gives us an idea of what holiness looks like. And of course, God is holy. He is the definition of holy. So if we live in obedience to him, we're going to be doing everything that fits under the law, right? So we don't worry about the letter anymore and we're set free to live in God's grace in such a way as, how does he say it? We can produce a harvest of good deeds for God. But see, when we try to live under the law, or back before we came to know Christ and were set free by his grace, we were bound to the law. We hadn't been released from the law. And everything we did, the sinful desires at work in us, the uh, the the law actually aroused those sinful desires. We're going to unpack what that means in a moment. Um, they produced a harvest of sinful deeds instead of a harvest of good deeds for God. So it's being trapped in this framework of letter of the law, which sin actually makes use of, or it's being set free by the grace of God and living in relationship with him seeking to please him and producing a harvest of good deeds, a harvest of obedience to God. So we're, we're back to that under the law or under grace. You get one or the other and you go, well, some people don't acknowledge the law, but they haven't accepted Christ. Where are they? They're still under the law. 
whether they acknowledge the law or not, there is still a standard of righteousness. There is still sin and there is still obedience. And we as humanity are broken, fallen, bent to sinning. We have a sin nature. Thank you, Adam, and our own choices as well. That needs to be redeemed. The law just helps us understand the depth of our need for redemption, our need for a savior. And that's, of course, part of Paul's larger discussion in all of this is to address that reality with the people at Rome, because there were some of the Jewish Christians at Rome that were really pushing more the Judaism side of things, more the, we have to follow the rituals, we have to follow the rules, we have to abide by the laws of Moses if we're going to follow God. And he's saying, no, the law doesn't save you. Now, we'll start to unpack this idea of the law and sin using the law, because that may seem like an odd idea to you, but I think it'll make more sense once we go through it. As we move into verse 7, Paul goes on to explain, he says, well, then, Am I suggesting that the law of God is sinful? You may go, why would he be suggest? Well, he's saying that, look, you know, um, when we obeyed the law, you know, that's when we were in trouble. That's when we didn't follow the spirit. When we obeyed the law, that's when sin, uh, evil desires built on that and produced a harvest of sinful deeds. So is he in some way saying that the law of God is sinful? Is he blaming the law for our sinful state? And he says, of course not. In fact, it was the law that showed me my sin. I would never have known that coveting is wrong if the law had not said you must not covet. But sin used this command to arouse all kind of covetousness desires within me. If there were no law, sin would not have that power. At one time, I lived without understanding the law. But when I learned the command not to covet, for instance, the power of sin came to life and I died. So I discovered that the law's commands, which were supposed to bring life, brought spiritual death instead. Sin took advantage of those commands and deceived me. It used the commands to kill me. But still, the law itself is holy, and its commands are holy and right and good. So, Paul's trying to make clear there the point. The law isn't the problem. We are. The law is holy and good. The law shows us God's righteous standard. And if we were to follow that righteous standard fully, then we would be in right relationship with God. But the reality is we're all sinful. We're all sinners. None of us are capable of living that righteous standard because we're not God. We're not holy. We're broken sinners. So we fall short. So we don't measure up to that standard. And as a result, sin becomes this dominant facet of our lives because we fall short of the law. He uses the example of, of covetousness and says, you know, look, I wouldn't have had a problem with it if the law didn't say don't do it. But our very nature our fallen nature as humans, is that when God says this is wrong, what's our immediate response? We're like kids. We immediately respond by going, oh, if you say I shouldn't do that, then I'm going to do that. We rebel. It's in our nature. And so as a result, the law becomes this focal point for our sin. When God says, this is wrong, don't do this, then that is a place where sin latches on 
Paul even uses the word here, deceived. And it's not accidental that he used it. Let's see, that was in verse... Uh, yeah. Hmm. Where was that? So I discovered, yeah, verse 10, and I died. So I discovered that the law's command, which were supposed to bring life, brought spiritual death. Sin took advantage of those commands and deceived me. Um, Paul is using the term deceived very specifically there. It seems to be a reference back to Genesis chapter 3, to the fall, to the idea that sin takes what is good and twists it and takes us captive to a lie, deceives us into this idea that it's right and what's right is actually wrong. And so, as Paul says, sin took advantage of those commands and deceived me. It used the commands to kill me. But still, the law itself is holy, and its commands are holy, right, and good. See, the law isn't the problem we are. Sin uses the law as that focal point to start twisting things, to deceive. But that's not what it's about. That's not what it's intended for. It's intended to show us our need for the Savior. Verse 13 says, but how can that be? Did the law, which is good, cause my death? Well, of course not. Sin used what was good to bring about my condemnation to death. So we can see how terrible sin really is. It is, excuse me, it uses God's good commands for its own evil purposes. So there he sums up this whole idea of just how bad sin is. Sin isn't just sinful. It isn't just rebellion of God against God, but sin is in its nature, a thing that takes the good things of God and twists them around into something that instead of bringing life, brings death. Sin does not create. Sin twists. Sin does not bring order. Sin corrupts. It destroys. And so it does with the law as well. Again, but how can that be? Did the law, which is good, cause my death? Of course not. Sin used what was good to bring about my condemnation to death. So we can see how terrible sin really is. It uses God's good commands for its own evil purposes. Don't be deceived. There's plenty of good things out there that you may look at and go, well, that's a good thing. Sin can still use it, twist it, distort it. In fact, in the life of believers, in the life of the church, I think one of the most effective tools Satan has is to get us focused on good things that aren't the best thing. Focused on things that seem to be good, but aren't what God is calling us to. And so we're seemingly pursuing something good, but we're just slightly off target from where God wants us to be, which means we're not following God. That's what it means. If we're not going the same direction that God is leading us in, we are not following God. We're going astray. Now, we don't like to think of it that way, but I'm close. Um, growing up, there was a phrase we always used, close only counts with, you know, hand grenades. Otherwise, close doesn't do much good. Now, don't ask about my childhood why we had that phrase, but we did. Um, 
close doesn't count when we're following God. Obedience counts when we're following God. Now, Paul's going to talk some about obedience, and there's some debate as we move into this next section, starting in verse 14, whether Paul is talking about his life before coming to Christ or struggles against sin in his life after coming to Christ. And in a certain regard, I think this text could apply either way. Uh, So I'll leave it up to you. How do you identify with it? Is this describing who you were before Christ, or is it describing the hope you have in Christ as you struggle against sin? So, let's begin by looking at the next set of verses, starting in 14. So the trouble is not with the law, for it is spiritual and good. The trouble is with me, for I am all too human, a slave to sin. I don't really understand myself, for I want to do what is right. So Paul's saying, look, there's a part of me I don't get, I don't understand, even in myself. He said, for I want to do what is right, but I don't do it. Instead, I do what I hate. But if I know that what I'm doing is wrong, this shows that I agree that the law is good. See, if I thought the law were bad, then I would be, hey, there's nothing wrong with what I'm doing. No, but I acknowledge what I'm doing is wrong, so I know the law is good. 17. So I am not the one doing wrong. It is sin living in me that does it. Now, don't read that and go, oh, Paul's saying he's off the hook. It's sin in him. It's not him. I didn't sin. Sin in me sinned. No, he's not saying that. But he's saying that there is this, uh, maybe the right term would be cognitive dissonance. There's this desire within him to follow God, to, to be obedient to the law, the commands of God. And yet there is something in him that even though in his head he's saying, I'm going to do this, he winds up doing that. He's, I wind up doing the things I hate. That's not what I want to do. He says, so I am not the one doing wrong. It is sin living in me that does it. Verse 18, and I know that nothing good lives in me that is in my sinful nature. I want to do what is right, but I can't. I want to do what is good, but I don't. I don't want to do what is wrong, but I do it anyway. But if I do what I don't want to do, I'm not really the one doing wrong. It is sin living in me that does it. So Paul's saying, look, there's a struggle that goes on. I want to live for Jesus. I want to live in obedience to him. And yet when I look at my life, I see that I wind up doing things that aren't in obedience to him, that don't follow him. We struggle with our sin, with our our fallen nature, with our desire to sin. We've been set free. We're no longer slaves to sin thanks to the grace of God through Christ. But it doesn't mean sin goes away. We struggle. Now, again, when when our lives are dominated by that sin and we have no desire to follow God, that would describe us prior to coming to faith in Christ. But even after faith in Christ, we are forgiven. We are redeemed. We no longer have that outcome that comes from being a slave to sin, which is our condemnation before God, eternity in hell. Instead, we have life and forgiveness. And our old self that was bound for hell has been put to death with Christ, and we've been given a new life, but we still carry this body. And in our flesh, we still struggle with sin. And we still find that in our in our spirit, in our soul, we desire to please God. And yet, what we actually do 
all too often doesn't line up with that. And we wind up doing things that we hate or behaving in ways that we know are not honoring to God and it's not what we desire and yet it's what we do. And we, wow, humans are so rational. We can, in in a totally irrational way, we can justify all sorts of things, can't we? Even in our own lives, when we, when we look at our own sin, when we look at the hurts that we inflict on others, when we look at, at the damage that we have wrought, and as we deal with other people, we approach them from the standpoint of, you know, I want you to forgive me. I want you to judge me based on what I intended, what in my heart I desired to happen here. That's what I want you to judge me on, not what I actually did. And yet, as we're dealing with other people in this life, we judge them based almost entirely on what did you do, don't we? See, the reality there is, and what that tells us about our own nature, is that we desire mercy for ourselves and justice for everybody else. They should get what they deserve, but I want to be judged by a different standard. It doesn't work that way. In our own lives, all of us struggle with sin. If anything, that should make it easier for us to live a life that is forgiving towards those around us, because we know that in our own hearts, we desire to live for God, and yet we find ourselves doing the things we hate, doing the things we don't want to do. Don't you think that's true for them as well? Give grace. Live with grace towards others. Forgive them. Not saying it's easy. Not saying I'm an expert at it. But I'm saying God calls us to forgive them. So Paul, back to Paul, is describing all of this going on within his own own life, own self. It says and again in verse 20, but if I do what I don't want to do, I'm not really the one doing it. It is sin living in me that does it. He says sin takes hold in my life. Sin twists. Sin leads me to do these things. He's not saying I'm not really doing it in a sense of I'm off the hook here. You can't blame me. It was, you know, Oh, it wasn't me. The devil made me do it. No. He's still culpable for it. He's still saying, look, I'm, it's me, but it's that human side, the fleshly side, the side that doesn't live for God, my fallen state that pursues that goal. I'm pursuing Christ. He goes on in 21. Let's pick up there. So in 21, he says, I have discovered this principle of life that when I, excuse me, that when I want to do what is right, I inevitably do what is wrong. I love God's law with all my heart, but there is another power or law, literally within me that is at war with my mind. This power makes me a slave to sin that is still within me. Oh, what a miserable person I am. Who will free me from this life that is dominated by sin and death? Thank God. The answer is in Jesus Christ, our Lord. So you see how it is? In my mind, I really want to obey God's law. But because of my sinful nature, I am a slave to sin. He sums it up there. He says, look, this is the principle I've discovered. This is the reality at work in all of our lives. Because this is a principle of life. It's like the law of gravity. You know, it's not a one-time thing. It's like gravity worked last week. This week, eh, who knows? No, it's a, it's a constant. It's there. It happens over 
and over. I know that every time I shift my weight forward, it's going to pull me forward. Every time. So I'm saying, I have discovered this principle of life. So what is it? That when I want to do what is right, inevitably, I do what is wrong. I love God's law with all my heart. In other words, I, I love what God calls us to. I love the holiness of God. It is the focus of life for me. I desire that. I pursue that. But there's another power, another law within me that is at war with my mind. This power makes me a slave to sin that is still within me. Not a slave to sin overall. Because I've been set free from that. That old self has been put to death with Christ. But as much as slave as much as sin still exists in my life, I find myself falling back into serving it instead of serving God. And my desire is to serve God. So I think Paul is giving us a window here into the reality of the struggle of what it is to follow Christ. It is a battle. I want to say daily, but really it's a moment by moment battle to follow God with our lives because we've been set free. If we try to live under the law, then we're toast. Okay. All we've done is given sin a huge foothold and try to measure up to a standard that we cannot achieve to reach a goal. We cannot reach instead. We have no choice really, if we're going to find life, but to find it in Christ Jesus and his grace that sets us free from the law and saves us by God's grace, not by our obedience to the law, but by God's love for us, being shown to us, being given out to us through Christ's sacrifice on the cross, atoning for our sin, and that atonement being applied to our lives. That makes the difference. But we need to understand the struggle against sin doesn't go away. The outcome changes, but the struggle doesn't go away. So we as believers saved by grace, not trying to live up to the standard of the law, but trying to live out grace in our lives so that we can, how did Paul phrase it so eloquently here? Uh, so that we can produce a harvest of good deeds for God. Yeah, that's what it is to live free from the law and pursuing Christ. But when we slip back into the law, we slip, slip back into being dominated by sin. We slip back into the do's and don'ts. And when we live by the do's and don'ts, we will inevitably wind up in the don'ts because that's sin working in our flesh but it doesn't determine our outcome that is in Christ and so we seek to serve Christ not serve the law we seek to live for Christ not to live for the law or to live for our old master sin we still struggle with but we've been set free and so Paul's expressing all of that in chapter 7 and there's a lot there and you can read through it and I suggest you find a, a, a more contemporary English version to read from New Living's a good one if you're going to read chapter 7 because if you try reading it in some of the old translations it gets really hard to follow just, just be honest about that. It, it's kind of tough. So I encourage you, Scripture is to be understood. Find a version that you can latch on to. It's not a bad chapter to memorize. And I think Paul is really addressing something that all of us, in fact, have to struggle with. 
Now, he doesn't stop there because the discussion goes on in the chapter 8, and he makes some things abundantly clear. If you've read chapter 7 and you're going, wait, I don't get this whole slave to flesh, slave to God, you know, how, how's it all fit together? I, I, hang with us because this is only part of the discussion. We'll pick up with chapter 8 next week, and I hope you will join us. Well, let's turn to God as we close in prayer. Heavenly Father, again, we thank you. You have given us your word. And Lord, I pray that your spirit would speak to our hearts through your word. Lord, that you would convict us of those areas in our lives where we have tried to live by the law or where we have been taken captive, deceived by sin as it twisted what you gave as something holy and good. And Father, help us to live every day in that dependence on you as our Savior, not on the law. Father, help us to live every day in that forgiveness and grace that you have given us. That as we struggle to live a life for you, bring a harvest of good deeds for you, Lord, that we would overcome the sin in our lives. Father, we pray that in your power every day, it would be less and less of the doing the things I hate, doing the things I don't want to do, and instead more of the living for you, that we may bring glory to you. Lord, we thank you for your grace and forgiveness. And we thank you in the name of Jesus the Christ. Amen.